Hello everyone, today we are going to be looking at the second layer I am making for this costume. It will be an underdress made of white silk that mimics the underskirt we can see Danielle wearing. These are the best screen captures I can find to see the details like the fabric type, the type of hem, and the neckline. Again, I'll mention, like I did in the video for the shift, that we see in this film the whole costume being one garment with no visible structure or undergarment shown, which wouldn't be how the garment would originally be constructed. So instead of one dress, I will be attempting to make this more historically accurate, maybe more like historically adequate, by separating the garments. The skirt in the film looks like a brocade with a white cream base color and some light gold patterning and I'm looking for only 100% silk to be historically accurate. I scoured the internet looking for remotely anything close to this on sites I trust, like Renaissance fabric and Fancy Styles fabric, and anything that came up in my Google and Etsy searches, and I just wasn't finding anything that was even close, like nothing that was a plain enough white brocade to use for this. The closest thing I could find was on puresilks.us, a company based in Mumbai, that makes tons of varieties of silk, but have a history with subpar customer service when I asked other costumers' experiences. But having found absolutely no alternative, I ended up risking it and buying eight yards for $160 from them because they had something that was semi-close to what I needed. The shipping, understandably, took quite a few weeks to get here, but I'm pretty happy with what arrived. It was a nice light cream color with a pretty brocade flower pattern on it and I think it will do the job for this project. For the interlining of the bodice, I used some leftover heavyweight linen from my stays project earlier this year. Now here's where it gets complicated. Because no extant garments survive from this period, we can only conjecture what the support garments worn were, if any. Earlier in the medieval period, I believe a kirtle was the main supportive garment, which was a fitted, tight dress to the body with lacing. Later in the 1500s in the Tudor period, there are bodies, which are structured garments which give a conical silhouette similar to stays. But for these high-waisted 1490s to 1500s garments, it's not known how these were structured. I asked other costumers who have outfits from this period what their solution was, and mainly they wore other period like Regency or 1780s stays to give the correct silhouette. But since I didn't already have those on hand, I decided to just make up my own solution. What I will be creating is a boned bodice that laces on the sides to act as what I've been calling a Renaissance bra that will then attach to the skirt. I got the basic bodice shape from the previous image, which is from an essay called Patterning Italian Renaissance Gowns, by Maestra Suzanne de la Fert. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. I will link it below. Without this, I would not have been able to do this project, so it is a very good resource. With my basic shape drawn out, I took measurements on myself to give me a good-ish starting point for this pattern. I knew it would undergo tons of changes, but having a starting point is important. Once I got the initial pattern for the front, I then moved to the back, making sure to match up the side seams and the top of the arm seams. I cut this out of a muslin fabric and sewed up the shoulder seams and one of the side seams for my first try-on. And as you can see, it's a uh, it's a uh, very wrong and way too big, which is much better than being way too small because all I need to do is go through and start pinching out where to remove the fabric from, which would be so much easier if I had someone to help me, or a dress form, or like four hands that were extra long. But you know, I like the challenge. Now the back was a bit more challenging. It's quite hard to pin out excess when you can't actually see what you're doing, but I just got a general amount by throwing a couple pins in and then I was able to 
add it to my pattern with no problem. The neckline and the straps needed some adjustment, and for that, instead of pinning out excess, I actually just drew on the changes I wanted with a sharpie and hoped it didn't bleed through to my clothes. Now I have to take those changes I made from the mock-up and transfer them over to my pattern to then make further adjustments from. I think I did at least one more mock-up that I didn't take any footage of before I realized that I needed to change the strap angle. In the film, the sleeves sit right on the edge of the shoulder, and that's not how this underdress was fitting, so I angled them to curve more so they sit farther out on the edge of my shoulder to match what's in the film. Instead of trying this mock-up on with a sports bra like last time, I actually threw on my 18th century stays to sort of imitate what it will be like when the boning is added, and the result seemed good enough for me to move on with. So, time for boning channels. With the mock-up semi-satisfactory, it was time to pull out the heavyweight linen and start the boning channel process. I drew on a boning channel design that made sense to me, pretty much just straight up and down lines. I sort of skinned over this process as it was very similar to my stays construction and I sort of just like got in the rhythm of things and didn't take very much video. But I did get a time lapse. One thing to note here is that I am sewing each boning channel from the top down instead of alternating directions going from top down to bottom up and this apparently helps with the fabric warping because you're not pulling it in two different directions as you're stitching up and down. I knew it would need more adjustment after adding the boning channels but I didn't realize how much. It was very oversized here and just super loose and the shoulders were sitting way off and I couldn't like pull them up so I started pinning out boning channels one at a time from the front and the back. Doing this was making it tighter and also was moving the shoulder straps further up the shoulders instead of being so far off. I ended up pinning out a total of eight boning channels from the front I added more fabric to the shoulder strap, and I took out two boning channels from the back. I sewed in those adjustments I made by cutting out all the extras, and I wanted to make sure I transferred over all those changes to my actual pattern pieces, so that if I need to cut out these again, I will have something to go on and also for the silk layer, I'll need the updated pattern pieces. Don't worry, I'm not leaving you hanging. Here is a, another mock-up try-on in the bathroom featuring the litter box as always. And confession time, I am so lazy that I thought why would I remake this? And this is just what is going to be in the guts of the bodice. It, it seems silly to redo all of that work. So mock up to final garment. I hate binding edges. So instead I just stitched the boning channels closed and then zigzagged the edges that allowed me to then just turn the edges into the inside and tack those down. 
And there we go. The boning channels are now closed off with no binding for me. No thank you. The next layer was supposed to be the silk wrapped around the front, but it was way too sheer and would look so bad with those boning channels visible from underneath. So I ended up cutting out a piece of linen to match the front and I literally just basted that in with the most giant stitches ever to smooth out the boning channels and make the black and white boning less visible. I used both colors because um, those were the leftovers that I had and I didn't want to buy anything new for this project. Now back to the silk. I was trying to be super conservative cutting this out because I did not want to run out of fabric for the skirt. You can see how thin this fabric is too and how it wants to like curl up on itself. I really should have cut these with bigger seam allowances because I'm I wanted to turn them over to the back side to wrap around and I wanted to flip the raw edge under but a lot of places on the tighter curves I wasn't able to do that which ended up okay and I was still able to secure them on to the the base layer but this would have been easier if I just cut cut it out with bigger seam allowance. I laid the silk on top of the bodice piece and threw a few pins in the front, then flipped it over to the back so that I could go around and pin all of the edges on before stitching them down. We are experimenting here to try to make the front look semi like it does in the movie. What it looks like to me is the same fabric that they used for the sleeves. They sort of gathered on top of the front of the bodice and then it looks like there's like a row of stitching here to sort of create this little, little ruffle shape and I'm thinking I can get the approximate size by gathering and pinning and then I can cut out like around here that will tuck under as well. And then I can roll hem the top. So that's gonna be like free here. And then I'll just tack it on with like back stitches all the way like straight across. And the rest of the sides will get tucked under this pattern piece. But I wanna see what it looks like first when I gather this on to see if I like how that looks or maybe I'll just ignore that sort of detail but I feel like it should look okay this fabric isn't it's like very stiff so it doesn't want to like do what I want it to do I'll probably have to like iron it down This is going to be really stupid. Hot. Hmm. I'll use this. I'm basically trying not to melt the pins because, you know, they're plastic and... Let's 
looking better. my god. <laughs> I can't figure it out. Okay. I did not want to unpin everything from the front, so I sewed the rolled hem on while the organza was still attached to the bodice. And I'm sorry to tell you that for some reason, some unknown reason, I don't have any footage of the satisfying pulling of the thread to create the rolled hem here. Um, I just have me sewing in the stitches and then I ended the clip. The loose edges were wrapped around to the back, pinned down, trimmed down, and basted in place. Once the organza was stitched down, I could trim off the edges even further. Here's an oops. The silk I cut didn't actually reach the whole strap, so I had to add in a little patch. Good thing this is going to be covered up by the overdress and wasn't too big of a deal. Now the final layer for this is going to be a layer of linen that is a medium weight, not the heavy weight that is on the inside of the bodice. And this is going to be covering up all of those layers on the inside of the garment that I have stitched down. And if you want a layer count, we are at six layers for the front and five layers on the back for just one bodice. This lining layer was added similar to the silk layer, except this time the edges are going to be turned under themselves because this is on the back side and doesn't wrap around to the front, obviously, because that would be ugly. To get this fabric to fold under itself nicely, you do need to clip along all the curved edges to get it to fold under and sit nice and flat. This was then sewed on, trying to go through as many layers as possible. I want everything to stay secure, so the other layers underneath this, I sort of loosely based it in place and wasn't trying to do anything very secure. So on this final sandwiching layer, I wanted to try to get everything in there in that stitch. For the eyelets on this project, I did them the same as I did in my stays project. Everyone seems to have their own way to do eyelets, but this is the way I like. I bring the thread over from a different spot and I make a knot there, holding that thread in place before I start sewing the eyelets. I start 
using two pieces of silk thread on one needle so that each stitch has four pieces of silk thread. And I start the eyelet using an awl to separate the weave of the fabric. Then just make stitches going all the way around. To end off each eyelet, I use the awl to widen out the hole again, and then I make a couple of knots to secure the eyelet in place and travel the thread back away from the eyelet before I trim it off. Now, moving on to the skirt, and for the first time in this project, I actually get to use a pre-made pattern. This is the period patterns number 41, and I'm using view 5. The reason I couldn't use this for the underdress is because the pattern just has a skirt and stomacher instead of a full underdress, and I needed a full underdress to match more historically accurate and also to provide structure. I love that this footage has this optical illusion of being in slow-mo because my air conditioning is blowing the pattern around and stopping it from falling to the ground. <laughs> For the underskirt, I need four panels, and luckily one panel fits on the fabric when folded. I was nervous about that, so I ended up having plenty of fabric to work with. One edge of each panel was cut on the selvage, so it won't need any seam finishing. I had a lot of tension issues sewing two layers of this silk fabric and I had to make a lot of adjustments to the wheels of doom as I call them, which I do not understand, but I eventually testing out got my tension to the right place. I'll give you one guess what I chose to do on the two skirt seams that were not on the selvage. I'm gonna French seam them. This requires right sides together. Oh, nope, I mean wrong sides together. Good thing I realized that here and flip this fabric over. These two seams are going to be the side seams, so an important thing to remember is that you don't stitch them all the way up. I think I left about 8 inches at the top of each seam, and that is for where the lacing is going to go so the garment can go on and off. After the first seam was sewed, you just need some trimming and ironing to get ready to sew the second seam. This fabric is very frayy and flimsy and very thin, so I always just like to do French seams on fabrics I'm worried about fraying because it just encapsulates everything that I'm worried about and will stop bad things from happening. Before I started the pleating process on this skirt, I was trying to think of a way to finish the top edge proactively. So without really thinking, I ironed the top edge over twice and then planned on stitching the skirt on in the center of that turned over edge so that the raw edge will be captured and it will just leave an overhanging folded edge on either side. 
To figure out my pleating math, I got the starting width of the fabric and the ending length, which is the bodice, and divided those two lengths by themselves and by the starting to get a decimal. Then dividing the chosen pleat width, which I did 0.5, by that decimal to find out how much fabric to use in each pleat, which came out to about 1.16 inches, which I will approximate. So with those numbers decided, all I have to do is make a mark every about 1.16 inches, and then from each of those 1.16 inches marks, I make back a 0.5 inch mark so that I can have exactly where to fold my pleats to. To attach the skirt to the bodice, I first pinned the right sides together, matching up the middles, but I realized that to sew it on, it would be so much easier to just pin the right side of the skirt to the wrong side of the bodice in its sort of finished arrangement. Then I could stitch just going until I hit the boning channel and just back stitch along there instead of... I was going to try to like catch the edges with the right sides together and then fold it open and I was worried about how that would work. I stitched the skirt on with a doubled up thread using back stitches for extra strength and I didn't take any footage of that because I just wanted to get it done. I hate attaching skirts. But this is what it looks like when it was finished. I ironed the edges down towards the hem to make the bulk kind of push out and flare out the skirt instead of taking up room in the bodice. I wanted the hem to train slightly in the back and go right to the ground in the front and my first pinning experiment actually worked pretty perfectly except Millie tried to sabotage the skirt, the delicate fabric, how dare she. Because this was my first time working with such a thin fabric that makes up the skirt, I decided to try something new and do a hem facing to achieve that thick hem we see in the movie. I cut strips of linen that were just scraps into four inch strips to then sew together, trying to cut these out with the rotary cutter on the straight grain. I cut off the extra fabric in the skirt in a very unorthodox way that was <laughs> pretty risky, but um, I like to live dangerously with the rotary cutter and being able to accidentally cut off fabric in an uneven way. Now that long strip of facing that I was hoping would go all the way around the skirt was then pinned on all the way along right sides together. And I did actually have plenty, as you can see the excess here, thankfully. After that seam was done, I ironed the facing up and pinned it in place for the last part of the hem stitching. I found sewing this much easier with laying it flat on a surface because that bottom fabric was so flimsy that I was worried it would like warp if I held it in my hands. So laying it completely flat on a surface and then just like using my needle to sort of like dig under the fabric and go up, I think allowed it to lay a lot flatter than holding it in my hand and sort of warping that thin fabric.
After all that work, we have the finished undergown that will mainly be covered all the way up by the overdress, but who cares? It turned out better than I could have imagined, and I think my Renaissance bra does a great job supporting all that boobage that Drew Barrymore definitely does not have. I love that I decided to do the side lacing. It's actually super easy to put on myself, and this undergown is so comfortable. I can just like sit on the couch in this outfit and have absolutely no problems because it's short, unlike stays, which can be uncomfortable to sort of slouch in. You can slouch all you want in this. Next step for this project will be making the sleeves that will attach onto these shoulder straps. And this video was already so long that that is going to be a completely separate video. So make sure to subscribe and check back if you're interested in seeing more of this costume recreation.